Welcome back to another podcast episode where we help aspiring developers get jobs and junior developers grow. So with this episode, we're going to be diving into Full Stack Academy. I invited on three graduates and they're going to share their real experiences. I think it's been up to a year since the last time I did the review. So I kind of just want to find out, you know, what's going on. I think a lot of you probably already know um, I went to Full Stack Academy. I graduated from Full Stack Academy. And so kind of like just seeing what's going on each year. Um, but I also heard some kind of rumors and a couple things that made me want to review it again. Um, just to be clear, none of you did this program through any campuses, right? No. Okay. So yeah, they're trying to extend their education into, from what it sounds like, more traditional education. So if you've heard of experiences from that, it's probably going to be really different. Um, so with that context in mind, we're going to dive into the real authentic experiences. So, okay. Uh, Mahir, is that how you pronounce your name? Yep. Okay. When did you graduate? Where are you at in your job search and what industry did you come from? Sure. So I graduated last April 21 and I'm currently working. I just started my job in November, 2021. I'm working with Cap Gemini. Um, as a junior developer there. And I was previously coming from pharmaceutical. So I was a pharmacy technician uh, for a couple of years. And then I decided to just make the switch. Okay, cool. Thank you. How about you, Anna? Um, yeah, so I graduated in July of 2021 and have been working as a full stack engineer since January 2022. So about three months now. Um, and prior to that, I was actually in medical school for two years. Um, so halfway done through school, decided to take a leave of absence and make that career switch. So totally different, but glad to be here. Okay. I'm guessing you're not going to be going back. Nope. <laughs> Best decision I've ever made. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I saw you smiling while you were saying that. Yep. <laughs> All right. Cool. How about you, Gabriel? Is it Gabriel or Gabriel? Gabriel. Um, yeah, I graduated in, I think, July or August, probably July of 21. Um, I had been working, I've had all kinds of jobs, but I've most recently been working as like an operations manager for a startup that did um, bike sharing. Um, yeah, decided that company um, went under at the beginning of the pandemic, decided to kind of returned. I have a computer science degree from way back that I never ended up using. So decided to kind of get a refresher and, and switch gears and went to full stack. Okay. Um, and then I've been working um, for a company called Education First as a software developer since this this January. So a couple months, three months, almost four. Wow. I have a very needy cat. I apologize in advance. <laughs> it's all good. Um, Okay, sounds good. Let's dive into the meat of things. But um, oh, I usually give people a heads up before the podcast, but we'll probably talk over each other. Like I said, I don't like it to be an interview. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you questions like an interview, but feel free to respond to each other. We're going to talk over each other. Usually it starts normalizing out about like 10, 15 minutes into it. But first question, what was your experience like? The good and the bad. Um, I could start. I... I really loved full stack for a number of reasons, um, especially towards the beginning. Um, I was somebody that always needed some structure. So, you know, when I was in college or med school, um, I always kind of needed um, a very organized schedule of what kind of learning materials uh, to take in and when to do certain things. So I liked that full stack was super organized in that way. Um, so I had a really good time um, learning from the instructors. I thought they were wonderful. Um, and pair programming was a great experience as well. And I think those are aspects of learning to code that you wouldn't really get outside of a boot camp environment. Um, the thing that I did not like, however, was the whole job search aspect of it uh, post boot camp. And I think I went into the boot camp kind of expecting a lot more than uh what uh actually happened and i think maybe what i've read online and what people promised was not exactly how things turned out at least from my experience 
um, I thought they would be a lot more helpful in, you know, providing contacts or um, making introductions to different companies and maybe getting your foot in the door a little bit more. Um, and I feel like you really have to be proactive yourself in order to make your job search successful. And, you know, I, I knew that, you know, anyway, I think in order for anything to be successful, you have to be really proactive. But I didn't really know. I thought they would be more involved in that whole process. So that was kind of lacking for me. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a really common misconception people have. Um, I don't think full stack advertises like they're going to get you partnerships or get you a foot in the door. Maybe they do. But I remember when I went to full stack Academy again, a long time ago, they had a career day where they invite hiring day mm -hmm. where they invited a bunch of people. And then what I had heard was they turned that career day and trying to get you in the door with employers into interview practice. So then they could bring in any company, right? A company that might not even be hiring a lot of engineers or might just be looking for fellows. Cause I had some complaints about that where they weren't really able to deliver on career day. So even thinking back to career day, did they bring in a lot of legitimate companies to like really get you in the door with some of them? For the one I was a part of, they had Bloomberg. That was like the biggest company okay. and like a, a couple like mid tier ones. Um, but the majority of them were like small startup companies. Um, and I don't think there were like, I had heard in the past that they had Facebook and, all these other bigger companies but for ours bloomberg was like by far the biggest and then they had um i think it was puma i want to say it was puma but they were they weren't really hiring for software engineering roles they were hiring for like technical roles but it wasn't to do with coding directly so i don't know i thought that was kind of interesting okay yeah it is good to know um, yeah i think go ahead. that like the the companies that they brought in i mean it's like any getting your first software job anywhere there's almost no job postings that say like we welcome brand new graduates you know so like i feel like a lot of the connections that full stack has is with companies that like want experienced people but i did so yeah the career day stuff was kind of underwhelming but i did really love all the like i think they call it career services like meeting with those coaches and like getting resume and like LinkedIn advice. I found that super helpful. Um, and also just like it was the career coaches I thought were super interesting to talk to and kind of fun. Okay. We'll dive more into the career coaching. So the thing is, you know, what I see on my end, um, a lot of roles are hiring entry level, but the entry level, the bar has just gone up. A lot of people are moving into software engineering, like a lot of people, right? And so the bar has gone up. And so what what's happening is a lot of coding boot camps aren't haven't really moved up that bar themselves because usually there's a lot of things that you have to do to really bump up that curriculum and even like you know some coding boot camps are trying to provide internship uh, support or like access to being able to edit a really large code base maybe it's like their marketing website or maybe it's an internal tool or even an open source project they recommend you contribute to and like you know a lot of coding boot camps try to be ambitious but then you know, a lot of people's money is tight nowadays and they can't really up that price. And so I think coding boot camps are trying to meet companies at that level. And I think they're struggling. And I don't necessarily think full stack. I'm sure that's a challenge for full stack academy, but it's not only full stack academy. Um, so bringing in companies that aren't really hiring for the experience that full stack academy puts out maybe the big advantage of that really is interview practice for most companies, maybe even startups that won't offer paid positions or be very welcoming to junior developers, but maybe you do, you know, like Puma. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, Bloomberg was the big one. Bloomberg. So maybe a, like those larger companies, people are going to at least look forward to those interviews to try to get their foot in the door. Um, that still sounds better than what they were doing because the last time i talked to full stack academy grads they really dropped the ball brought in startups with like non-paying positions and like promised things mm -hmm. during that career day and it felt like they were going through a transitionary period and it seems like they're stabling out a bit with that yeah i know there was one company they brought in where or maybe a few actually that we had some people get a job like right after career day like that 
that kind of got their foot in the door. Um, I do know that the companies that I was interested in that I reached out to, they didn't even get back to me with um, an interview. So maybe they weren't hiring. Um, we also had Code Academy come, which was exciting, but that was another company that, you know, they didn't have an apprenticeship program open. Um, they kind of plugged that, you know, to keep an eye out, but you know, it was good to talk to them, but I was kind of hoping that there would be more available roles for, for us. Yeah. Makes sense. Sounds like at least with people that have that expectation that they're going to just like hand you off to companies, it's probably not a realistic expectation. For sure. Um, I do, I do have one question. So last time also, I'm going to be bringing up like last videos and stuff because I'm very curious, but I heard that people were unsatisfied with the Grace Hopper program because of how the administration was run. And when they would talk to people in like the regular program, they had felt that they weren't getting as quality of an experience because of the administration. Have you experienced anything like that? Um, I will say, I don't know about the administration. Um, and I really loved our instructors. I really can't say a bad word about them, but I will say there was maybe once or twice where we had some lecture that was combined with full stack and maybe it was just, you know, how their cohort was structured throughout their program. But I felt like people seemed more knowledgeable and how they were answering questions and how they were participating. And then a lot of us Grace Hoppers ended up, you know, conversing afterwards and being like, Oh, you know, they seem like they've have like a different sort of education or maybe they're, you know, prompted to participate more or something like that. So it was maybe noticeable during that time, but it's really hard to compare, you know, cause I, I don't know how full stack really ran, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. I think, so I, I've heard that pretty consistently too. And so I do feel like that's good feedback for them and a, a problem they probably should try to solve. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about you two? What do you guys think of your experiences? Um, overall, I thought it was good because I was coming from like very little experience with coding. I had tried to teach myself and it was just going horribly. So I decided to enroll. Um, and I thought the instructors especially were super patient and were, were willing to take extra time to explain because at the beginning I was having like a really hard time putting things together and they were willing to to take some time with me and uh, walk me through it a little more. And I thought that the projects were pretty good uh, when we were learning in the junior phase, that's what they called it. Um, just constantly like working on projects, uh, short lecture to projects. So it was a lot of hands-on experience. And I, I enjoyed that part a lot and working with others. The part that uh, I was kind of, that was kind of a negative as well was the career part, like after graduating. I think part of it was me. I had like a bit of an imposter syndrome going to it. Like I was super nervous going into it. And I think that held me back a lot and I probably should have asked for help that time, but yeah, it was just kind of overwhelming it jumping in. I, I felt kind of un underprepared. I liked the career uh, coaching, but even with that, I just felt like, okay, what do I even do here? There's so much going on. There's like, I have to do this resume, but I have to do like a special resume for every single one. <laughs> and it's like, it was just a lot of like practicing for interviews. I didn't really feel that prepared for technical interviews. I know we had like a section on that, but I was still super lost after. Um, it just took a lot of time on my own to get ready for those. But yeah, overall, I think it was a good experience. Okay. Did you do a mock interview, a mock technical one? Yeah, we would do mock tech interviews pretty frequently. Um, I think it's just understanding it for me, at least. Would be difficult. Well, Oh, just to be clear, you're not talking about like the early morning exercises that you're doing, but an actual mock technical interview. Oh, okay. Yeah. We, we would do the morning one, but I don't, I don't think we did like a full on okay. mock technical interview. Okay. That, that's something that I did that I found really helpful. I am someone that um, even if I'm enjoying a problem, sometimes I won't show it and I'll be like, and I'll sound frustrated. And like, even that alone, that instructor, I remember my instructor saying like, I don't know, I'm not supposed to grade you on this stuff, but you kind of sound depressed that you're even here. It's like, oh, I'm not. And I did, I had no idea. And like that experience was really, really helpful. Um, I wonder why they took that away. Hmm. 
Okay. When uh, I was doing it, they combined it with uh, like career or job search prep. So we would do the morning problems. And then during the period before, we had like a week to just do practice problems in the morning. But it was like a half an hour. I think you get like a half an hour to try it, to try one problem, and then you just go over it. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it sounds like overall, like, usually I hear good things about the curriculum. I hear really good things about the curriculum. Before I heard the instructors, very transitioning, uh, transition. well, it was a transitioning period for a lot of instructors and a lot were quitting. And then they would, new instructors would come up and then they would have to like learn the curriculum and they would be behind. And that was the experience I heard with my last review, but it, sounds like the instructors for both of you were pretty good you enjoyed your experience with them yeah i personally thought our instructors were amazing yeah yeah i liked them a lot we did have that happen actually one that i really enjoyed working with left in the middle of the cohort and they brought in someone new who was great and super smart um but like didn't have necessarily like hadn't done it you know much and was a little uncomfortable sometimes <laughs> Um, but overall, I think they were great and the curriculum was great. Okay. What about, hmm, you know what? I'm going to pause there. Uh, Gabriel, how was your experience? Um, it was good. I, I really enjoyed the time. Um, I had also been trying to learn myself before that. Cause I decided like, I have a background in programming, like, I have Google, like I can, you know, the resources are out there. I can figure stuff out and work on my own. But um, the truth is like the structure that's missing is like, like I can learn stuff on my own and read tutorials and like make stupid projects, but I'm not going to do that 40 hours a week unless some, unless I have to. And that was what kind of motivated me to finally sign up um, and the networking side of it. And um, it was really interesting and enjoyable, I think, working with other people because you're always the, so much. Initially, I did, really didn't like pair programming because I would like, I don't know, rather figure something out on my own. But it was really interesting to work both with people who were like sort of behind you and struggling and you can kind of like share what you there's like no better way to learn something than to teach it to someone else. Um, and then, you know, the inverse of when you're working with someone who just seems to get everything instantly. Like it's it's really interesting to kind of pick up on how their brain works um but i had a good experience yeah i i would echo what everyone said that the the job placement stuff was like maybe a little weak but um i really like the curriculum i really like the instructors yeah okay besides what they mentioned um because i remember you sharing in a message you had you also had some constructive feedback is there anything else that they can improve um, I've been thinking about this and I don't know, it's a really tough thing to do at all. You know, like programming is hard. Otherwise engineers wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't call them engineers. They wouldn't be paid as much as they are. Like, and it's really tough to have one program targeted at people who have potentially zero background, not just, there were some people I was surprised by both people who struggled and also people who did really well, who just had like very little computer experience, like would struggle with, you know, like down installing some software or things like that. Um, and I think it's a really tough thing to try to tailor one curriculum to all of those people. Um, How would you do that? And I don't, the thing I always kept coming back to is time. Like if you, there's a reason a bachelor's degree takes four years because there's just so much to learn and it's tough in kind of like you mentioned, with the cost of the program, you could make it twice as long and cost twice as much, and it'd probably be more than twice as good, but you have to target this like certain amount, the certain price tag and a certain amount of time commitment that people can, you know, commit to not working for that long. And um, it's a, it's a hard bargain. I think, I, th I think like, maybe I think a lot of people would have done better with more foundational stuff rather than kind of the really detail oriented like here's how these particular tools work and here's how you know the ins and outs of like express server or something because like especially coming having worked now as a software developer like 
there's very little expectation that you know for a junior anyway that you know the ins and outs of everything out of the box like you come in no and there the expectation is that like we have this whole code base that you've never seen before it's going to be there's going to be wacky stuff in it there's going to be stuff you can't google there's going to be all this you know like stuff you have to learn and i think that sometimes the full set curriculum kind of errs maybe it maybe is like a little bit too detail oriented in the middle part of it when more time might be better spent on like foundational stuff about programming and like system design system design in particular i think is something that is a little under sort of like under taught which like i don't know how you teach that but coming into the job i'm working now and like being thrown into this code base which had you know i thought i knew react but there's like patterns that we're using now that i had never seen before and like it's, it's been really interesting to kind of think critically about why decisions were made the way they were and that's something that i remember thinking like man i wish we had talked more about this kind of stuff at full stack I like and less just like here's how you set up a basic you know whatever yeah yeah that's that's really good insight. And so system design is really tricky. I'm not a huge fan of teaching system design early. And I think it's okay to build messy projects. It's okay not to care about architecture initially. And I think people need that feedback initially to reinforce even that they're enjoying coding, that they're liking what they're building. And, you know, sometimes you can reinforce the concepts you're learning without worrying about all this heavy stuff like system design and architecture and a lot of conventions that you're going to learn down the road. So yeah, I wonder if Full Stack Academy did implement that. I could see it being very beneficial later on. Like, mm -hmm. like, and like you said, really getting the foundation down. But one thing I want to mention, so usually coding bootcamps solve for this by being very strict in who they bring in. And so it's it's really having a rigorous interview process to make sure you're even ready and that's how you get everyone on the same page that person that did could uh, they were just struggling to install like a random software like that person shouldn't have made it in quite frankly like they should have spent some time before they made it in because i've heard way too many horror stories of people that just blow close to twenty thousand dollars and full stack academy is expensive it's up there and you know they they struggle with stuff like that it's like how did you even make it in how are you going to like you said a lot of curriculums will jump a little bit too deep too quickly how is that person really going to like keep up with the material they're going to fall behind and i hear this with so many different coding boot camps so the one concern I have, I've heard stories, Full Stack Academy has continued to lighten their interview process. And it's not as strict as it used to be. Now, I don't expect you to know how strict that was, right? But I feel like that could solve that problem. But yeah, what do you think about like the application and interview process to even get into the program? Um, I thought it was probably like again we i don't really have anything to compare it to but of medium difficulty i kind of did expect it to be a little bit more difficult um that could be a result of me just over preparing as well um i will say i my boyfriend who actually is also um was thinking about applying a full stack he went through this process this was just a few weeks ago and he actually um, I think he mentioned that I had finished a cohort and they like accepted him without giving him a coding interview. So he had just finished um, the application process. I think there was one um, like multiple choice um, mini assessment uh, for coding, which he took while he was sitting next to me. And then they literally accepted him either the next day or maybe even the same day i can't remember without giving him like a live like coding pair coding interview and i thought that was kind of crazy and he also was kind of actually turned off by that because you know he's thinking like wow they didn't even interview me it's like kind of a red flag like who are they really letting in and again that was not my experience i did have a live interview and that's kind of i i thought was the standardized process um, so I thought that was a little bit weird, but, you know, I thought my interview really did test like, you know, concepts of recursion, which, you know, isn't a super basic concept. Um, so, you know, I thought it was pretty good for myself, but I did find it a little weird that he had that experience just a few weeks ago. So, 
with the recursion, did you say you were tested with multiple choice? No. So it was a, like an algorithm question. It was pretty basic um, from what I remember. It wasn't the most complicated one, but it was an algorithm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, recursion's hard, really hard mm -hmm. when you're starting out. Um, it took me a long time to wrap my head around that. So I'm glad they still kind of test for that. I'm guessing that's like a stretch goal during the interview. I would assume so. Um, I have that. That actually scares me that they just let him in without the technical interview. Me too. Me too. I was very shocked by that. We were, we we're sitting there like, what? <laughs> so yeah, that, I, I don't, I don't know why I really don't. Maybe it's cause he said that I finished and maybe they thought, oh, because I would be there to help him, but you know, I'm just, I'm just speculating. I don't know. Yeah. That's a big, bold expectation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, well, and that, that creates a really huge problem. It doesn't matter how good the curriculum is. It doesn't matter how good the instructors are or caring. They are. It just does not matter if you are not prepared for that curriculum. I know the curriculum. I, I'm sure they've edited it since I've been in it, but probably not that much. I know what they teach and I know how they teach those things. And there are so many people, even when they were tested rigorously to get in and they had like a really rigorous application process and they were tested on recursion and a few other really advanced concepts. It, they, they struggled through the program. They struggled to keep up. We all did. Like it was really difficult and for your boyfriend to just get in like who knows he might be that person maybe he's not that struggles to install the software to even run the code right um how do they know that so man that's a that's a huge red flag i'm wondering i'm wondering why that happened yeah i don't know, I don't know. um okay well that's how you solve that problem that's how everyone becomes on the same page. And, you know, a lot of people talk about, I say this over and over, a lot of people talk about, well, we want the program to be accessible. It's like, well, accessibility doesn't mean letting anyone in, having them pay you $17,000 and then failing out of it. That's not accessibility. You're not giving a someone a fair shot at the industry. But like if they had like made a more rigorous pre-course work or practice, I know like they used to say like first four chapters of eloquent JavaScript, go through those, understand them fully. And that was at least can give like a, they were pretty certain that that was a good benchmark that they would at least do pretty well in the interview process. I don't know if they still do that, but pre-coursework to even just, um, just make sure they're up to speed for the interview that every coding bootcamp should have that. So, okay. Let me think about that more. That's, that's an interesting point. What do you guys think about the application process? I thought it was fair for me. It was also pretty medium. It did take a lot of prepping on my side. They offered, a, it was discounted because it was the COVID times, but like a prep course or prep class, I forgot what they called it, um, that, that went over like objects, arrays, recursion, and all that. I thought it was fairly thorough. I think another big aspect that might hurt people was the size of the class. Because my class had like 65 people in it uh, and two instructors. And so it. Wow. Yeah. So there was portions where we were kind of rushing um, just because people were asking so many questions and we were like, all right, we have to get to the project, you know, ask questions when you're, when you're in there and you're still stuck, you can ask questions there. And it kind of, I mean, it, it was new having that many people in the class because of COVID and more people just joining. Um, so I think maybe they were just like underprepared for that, but I do think that that, I just noticed that that helped or held a lot of people back because eventually people stopped asking questions because they were just getting overwhelmed with, you got people asking really technical, like very complicated questions. And you kind of look at it like, oh my God, what is he even saying? <laughs> I don't even understand the question. So it can kind of, you know, be a lot for some people. And so I think that hurt as well from what I noticed. That's really interesting because we had, I think, 30 people in my cohort and we also struggled fitting everything in. So I can't imagine how much you guys struggled having like more than twice as many people. It's crazy. How many instructors? Yeah, like a lot of, oh, sorry, go ahead. Two instructors for us as well. Yeah, we had two, I think, for 50 or 54 or five students. 
Um, but also the fellows, I think they have like, I think they try to have like one fellow, like teaching assistant per like six or seven or eight students, probably per seven students. And I found them really interesting to work with. Um, but I always, you know, wish I had more direct time with the instructors for what sure. Interesting. Um, it was interesting to work, to talk with people who had themselves just done the program and they had like very specific knowledge and they also like everyone in the cohort had like really different backgrounds and different levels of like familiarity with programming before the, the program. Um, and they all just had a very different style and like different sort of levels of, um, I don't know, just different ways of communicating. Some of them would, would like instantly have the answer, but not necessarily be able to communicate the ins and outs of it. But, and others would be like, well, I don't know, let's figure it out together. And that was always, I think, really interesting, sort of like pair programming with someone who is actually going <laughs> to be able to figure it out. Unlike your actual partner. Um, but yeah, it was, it's, yeah, it was, it would be tough to like, I think for the really excelling students and the really struggling students, only having two instructors per cohort was tough because there is so little time directly with them. Um, but yeah. How many, so for all three of you, how many people were in your starting cohort and how many graduated with you? I'm not sure. They definitely don't publicize that. I remember trying to think like, oh, there's this many people in Zoom after, like, you know, there's different gates that you pass through and people potentially drop off at each one. And I remember thinking when those pass, like, oh, are there fewer people in Zoom today? But I could never really, I, my sense is probably like three or four out of our cohort that I think started at 55. But I wouldn't want you to quote me on that. Cause they don't, obviously they don't announce like, Oh, four people got cut today. Okay. Yeah. I think through each phase, like from foundations to junior and then from junior to senior phase, I think we probably lost around five people to four or five. And we started out with less. So it was kind of a lot. Um, and I remember even talking in the beginning of junior phase with people being worried about it because maybe they had heard that happening before and people are, you know, were thinking, Oh my God, I don't want to be left behind. Like, do I have to study like a crazy amount? Um, but Don, like you said, I think that if, if there was a more rigorous like entry process or application process, maybe that wouldn't happen as much. And maybe that's a better way to tackle it rather than having people worried about whether or not they're going to even graduate. Yeah. What about you, Mahir? Yeah, I think it was roughly the same amount. Um, when I when we started senior phase, I, I noticed like a few, uh, like a, a little bit less in the Zoom. So, but I don't know the exact number. But I do remember after the first, there was like the, the final project, the JPFP. And then there was uh, like a midterm type of project right after. And after that, I, I remember a lot of people in the chat were like, I'm going to have to replay because I feel lost and things like that. I mean, not everyone, most people figure or were able to figure it out and move on. So it might be just like fear or just being nervous about it. But I, I noticed that as well. Like early on, people were pretty, pretty worried. Okay. Well, <laughs> Okay, so listening to all of you, it's like night and day because I just reviewed a program. I might be butchering the numbers, but I was like 120 people started in a, and this is a different coding boot camp, and then like 30 were left over. And it was one of the top coding boot camps or top coding boot camps that claim to be that. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's always unfortunate when people get held back, but you know, out of 30 people, like if five people fall back, that can be solved with a rigorous application process, not letting your boyfriend in just because he signed up, you know? Um, <laughs> but the screening that you guys went through, it doesn't sound bad. It sounds pretty good. And um, I'm not really, yeah, with foundations, um, 
there were there were definitely a few people that got held back. I th- well, at least I think with foundations with mine. So I'm more concerned about like, okay, are they getting held back at midterms after that junior phase, going into senior phase? That's what I'm most concerned with. And it they could improve it, but it's not as bad as uh, definitely some other programs that I've reviewed. Um. Okay, I think that gives me some good insight. I think I touched on a lot of things I was concerned with previously. Um, let's jump into the career services. I know we touched on that a little bit, but uh, what do you guys think of it? Um, I thought overall it was helpful in the sense that it was one-on-one and they were like reviewing my resume and helping me with like behavioral interviews. And I was able to... With my career coach, I was able to, he, he allowed me to use his like LinkedIn network to find anyone and he would put me in touch with them. So I thought in that aspect, it was pretty helpful to make connections and all. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed working with the career coaches. Um, I thought it was super interesting and like, like I'm not someone who's good at like bragging it about themselves and like putting themselves out there and being, you know, kind of a, go getter in an awkward interview context. So it was interesting. It was, it was, it was, I think it was really good to be able to kind of refine your narrative and figure out what parts of your story, like you want to sell and the behavior, the like mock behavioral interviews, I think were, were super interesting to help with that and being able to have someone jump in and say like that thing you just said, don't say that you know, or like that thing you said was great. Like, let's, you know, expand on that. And like, you know, here's some other details that you told me before that you left out. And I think that was super interesting. Um, Like others have said, I I think like the actual career day stuff and like making connections with actual companies that have actual openings was like pretty weak or sort of non-existent sometimes. But um, I know some people from my cohort got jobs related to career day events um but a lot didn't yeah i would kind of echo uh what everybody said i really enjoyed the behavioral mock interviews as well i feel like they almost placed more of an emphasis on that rather than the technical aspect of the interview which the end of the day is is i think more important because you know you can't really get a job if you don't know how to solve an algorithm or or however else they're going to test your technical knowledge. Um, But refining the way you talk about your career transition is also super important. So I did find that to be really helpful. I do wish we had more like technical mock interviews though. Yeah, I felt pretty unprepared for technical interviews. And the couple that I did, the one at my company now was it was like kind of soft in some ways. It wasn't like crazy algorithms or like goofy word problems that you have to, you know, figure out the math behind. It was much more like sort of design oriented and like, how would you set up a, not even necessarily, there was very little actual code too. It was very like, um, you know, how would you approach this problem? And yeah, most of the technical interview prep um, at full stack was like, reactos they call them like algorithm problems and um and i found those super interesting but yeah it it wasn't representative of what i ended up seeing in my actual interviews so that's really interesting because i don't think i had a single interview that didn't include at least one algorithm so that's that's interesting that you had a different experience I think it's maybe a not common experience, but, um, but even the others for jobs that I didn't get or wasn't, didn't turn out to be interested in, there were a lot more conversational, which I thought was, you know, probably for the better. I didn't, I I didn't interview with like Google or Facebook that have like notoriously, you know, like heavy technical interviews, but, um, yeah, I wasn't really sure what to expect. And then when I had them, I was always, I would always leave them being like, wow, that was not what I was expecting. I have no idea how I did. Yeah, most of my interviews were like not data structure and algorithm. So I was pretty shocked also. I only had, oh. I think like one or two. But actually, it was only one that was really like hardcore lead code type. Um, the rest were like asking me about projects or stuff like that. So I was pretty, pretty shocked. But yeah. Okay. 
Well, and it sounds like you're alone on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. To hear that. Yeah. I thought this was everyone's experience. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> well, maybe that's telling. Maybe that's why they excluded it. They found a lot of their students are not experiencing these types of interviews. And quite frankly, like for the interviews that I did experience with that, I mean, the Reactos, uh, Reacto, that's what it's called, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, um, those challenges in the morning, I felt like they did help me prepare more. And the technical interview that's like more focused on like a whiteboarding challenge, you're kind of already doing that. At least like with the mock interview I received, I just received another problem that was similar to those challenges. But then I got personalized feedback. That's what was helpful, right? So maybe like even just making sure they have enough TAs, enough instructors to be able to provide that feedback during those. I think you would be surprised at how well maybe that full stack academy prepares you for those types of challenges um because there there are so many different interview types and usually coding boot camps will lean on like preparing you for the whiteboard interview but they don't really a lot of coding boot camps lack that behavioral i didn't even get that i wish i would have got that mock interview and talked through some of that and had someone tell me don't say that right i wanted that feedback i didn't get it and i would I bet you there's a reason they did focus on that type of mock interview versus the technical. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't even think about it that way. Yeah, that makes sense. It's also tough because people come from such different backgrounds. Like, like in my capstone project group, one guy had been like a investment banker or something like that, or he worked for, I, the kind of like financial stuff that I don't really know what it is. I just know that he works for a financial company. And one of my, the other group members was a guy, like a pretty young guy who worked in like food trucks and stuff. And he'd never gone to college and he decided he was going to do this. And he was great. Um, and I think it's like, makes it really hard to figure out what kind of interview prep, because they would have needed very different, you know, sort of help. Um, but yeah, I found the interview prep stuff pretty helpful. Okay. I don't think I, I feel like I have a feel. So I just kind of want to summarize a bit. I think, and you correct me if I'm wrong afterwards. I feel like all of you experienced, um, I don't know, you all, why well, I heard medium a lot. So you experienced some sort of gatekeeping into the program. Um, the fact that you, were proposed to tackle a recursive solution. That's a pretty good sign, in my opinion. Um, I'm a little worried that they might have softened those requirements since you guys graduated, given what you t just told me, Anna. I hope that they're not mm -hmm. just letting anyone in. And if they are, that should be a red flag. That's going to, trust me, that's going to, so like when you get a, a variety of experiences, the instructors cannot meet the needs of all those experiences. It's either going to focus on people that are excelling or people that are falling behind. And it's 99% of the time it's focused on people that are falling behind to try to catch them up. Less attention has gone towards the people that are doing really well. Um, that's what it creates. And it makes that a much worse situation. Um, so I hope they're not doing that. Maybe that was an exceptional thing. But if anyone is going through Full Stack Academy and you aren't going through a technical interview, it should be a red flag. I'm going to be blunt about it. You should... Uh, don't don't consider it that that's always a red flag so uh but other than that if that's an exception and not the rule the interview process sounds okay when you have a lot of tas versus even if you just have two instructors i know everyone wants more time with the instructors and preferably it's one instructor for like you know 10 students i would say that's ideal and then maybe one ta and like when I, I've reviewed a lot of different coding boot camps, that seems to be like a really ideal thing where people feel like they're given the attention they need to succeed no matter where their skill level is at. But when you do have more TAs, if they have a hard, uh, really strict selection process, you know, selecting probably like top students of the previous cohort, that can balance things out more. Um, as long as you're getting that assistance, I think that can be helpful. Sounds like you guys really enjoyed the curriculum, the instructors. Um, I do think they need to solve for that problem with the Grace Hopper program. Anna, your story is not unique. I've heard that story many times. Um, I even mentored um, people like I, they used to host like a mentorship program. Um, and I went back and mentored alumni. And that was also feedback that I got from there and other students that shared with me later. Um, career services. 
I don't know. I know you guys want the technical mock interview, but I think that behavioral one is pretty cool given that you already have the Reacto. And I mean, Mahir, your career services coach being willing to like share connections on LinkedIn, that's pretty huge. You don't hear that a lot. And I, I'm telling you, I've I've heard a lot of stories about career coaching with Full Stack Academy over the last five years, and there's been a lot of burnout. I do think the career coaches are always pushed very hard. I have a lot of empathy, empathy for them, but I, I've i also had really, I had a very bad career coach initially, and they no one in our cohort liked her. And then they, uh, I was in the Chicago campus, and so they, she was our default, and then they switched us, and then I really liked that one. So I feel like they've always struggled to find and keep really good career coaches that aren't burned out. So the fact that all of you have had good experiences, it sounds pretty promising that they're starting to solve that problem. Um, yeah, I think I asked all the right questions. I think this is going to give people a lot of valuable information. I guess my last question for you, thinking about the people that are considering this program, and feel free to share anything extra you want to share that we haven't talked about. Um, who's the right student for this? Who's going to be successful in this? And who probably isn't going to be successful that probably shouldn't waste 17000 or whatever they charge? I think if I had to pick like one characteristic, it would probably be somebody who's very self-motivated and a self-starter and just a proactive person in general. Um, like while full stack provides you with so many resources and great co uh, coaches and great instructors and all the materials, you really won't be successful unless you put in the work. Um, and everybody always says this, you really get as much out of the boot camp as you're willing to put in. And I fully agree with that. Um, you know, I did struggle a little bit in the job search process, but it ultimately did end up panning out. And it worked out for a lot of my cohort members as well. Like everybody who I've worked with and I'm still friends with a lot of um, those women, they all got jobs, you know? And so while we may, you know, uh, criticize the career services a little bit, you know, people who are proactive will like, they do have the right tools and the right skills to get a job. So it really, I think just depends on you at the end of the day. So you know, if you're willing to put in the work, I think that's probably like the most important part. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think also you have to be really honest with yourself about whether you are that person and like really figure out, like fi figure out your ability, not to necessarily like pick things up instantly, but your ability to like really like keep, pushing when you don't get something and like how do you how do you respond when you are faced with a problem that you just don't even know how to start with like are you going to get frustrated and like lose focus or are you someone who's going to just like go that much harder because you just can't do it and it's like i think what something that makes people good at this kind of thing is when you have that like almost obsessive like you know, somebody out there knows somebody out there figured out how to do it and I can do it. I just got to like, you know, try something different or whatever. And like being that kind of person who, cause like everyone says that about things like boot camps, and everyone knows that boot camps that you get out what you put in, but like really figuring out what that means to you, I think is, is important to ask yourself before you spend all that money. Um, Cause there's going to be days where like, you also have to be down with working a lot and like working after hours and like, you know, logging off for the day and going and doing something for a couple hours and then coming back and like figuring out that thing that day that you couldn't get before, or like putting a lot of like honest effort into the workshops or the checkpoints, the little tests and projects. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, you have to be either, you have, you have to be a self-starter. And if you're not, you have to be honest with yourself about what you can do about that. That yeah. self-analysis is hard. Yeah. It's really hard. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, I would, I would agree. You have to be honest about 
where you stand if you even really like coding that much i think because i i don't know I, I feel like the the salary you kind of you could look at salary and then just kind of like want to jump in but if you if you don't actually like it and you don't have somewhat of an interest in it i think it could be kind of hard to just stick with it if you want to get like super challenging and you know, a little bit overwhelming so if you're interested in it and you're willing to to put in that extra work and reach out when you need help i think it's definitely possible but without that i don't i don't really see how you can get very far even with all the help how do you feel like you're going to like it enough for you to be successful i think there's enough online resources where you can build like basic web pages or even code wars that's something i did prior and if you can for like for me code wars was like super almost like borderline addicting so like once you start and if you even the problems that i just could not crack if, if the fact that you're constantly coming back to it and then trying side projects on the own and on your own and wanting to learn more and kind of the reasoning behind why things work the way they do i think that's a, a pretty decent indicator that you, you're interested in the topic okay it's good advice it's really good advice for prospect students um yeah i love it i really appreciate hearing this like i said uh full stack i mean i'm i'm pretty critical of all coding boot camps but i still want to see full stack academy succeed i can't give them any favoritism so i'm always going to be critical but i'll probably check back in maybe like a year later i actually i want to do a review on the campuses because where i hear a lot of bad reviews are frankly them quite just trying to make more money they're expanding their education to different campuses and i hear a lot of bad stuff about that so i'm not sure i haven't confirmed any of it specifically besides people sharing stuff with me so if i do another full stack academy review it'll probably be focused on that in this year but um yeah, that's it. This is helpful. So let's go ahead and do our outros. Um, Mahir, if you want to share anything, if people want to reach out to you, where could they reach you? Uh, best place is to find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you could just, if you want to ask me more questions about my experience or my job search, you could just search my name. I'm probably the only one <laughs> with that name. So yeah, just reach out to me. Just send me a message. I'll and just mention that you found me from the podcast and i'll be happy to help you okay sounds good yeah so uh just a little tip guys you got to start putting connection notes because you guys will receive connections but they won't say why you have no idea yeah. who they are i'm telling you if you watch this episode these guests will usually connect with you and help you but you have to put a connection note you don't just randomly send it yeah definitely especially if you don't have any mutual connections i'm probably not gonna accept it exactly how about you anna um, same thing. I think LinkedIn is probably the best place. Um, and if you search my name, I think I'm also probably the only one with my name, uh, with my last name, at least. Um, yeah, that's probably the best place. And yeah, ditto to what Mihira said. Sounds good. How about you, Gabriel? I think also LinkedIn. I, I would love to have some like really sick personal projects page. I had big dreams when I was in the job search of like, oh, I'm going to work. I'm going to have this awesome website that I built from scratch and the employers are going to see it and their minds are going to be blown. But yeah, LinkedIn is all I got. Yeah. And I also have a unique name, so uh, I'll, I'll be there. Yeah, all three of you have pretty unique last names, so it should be easy to find you. What I'll probably do is include your LinkedIn's in the description so people can just click on it, add you. But yeah, uh, seriously, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your experiences. Um, stick around for a couple minutes. But thank you, Mahir, Anna, Gabriel. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you.